now that we are recording the National Skills Coalition webinar, Data Tools for Workforce Policy, Lessons from the State Workforce and Education Alignment Project, I'll turn you over to State Policy Director Brian Wilson, and we can get started. Thank you, Sylvia. Good day, everyone. I'm Brian Wilson, State Policy Director with National Skills Coalition. Welcome to today's webinar on the lessons learned from the State Workforce and Education Alignment Project, or SWEEP. SWEEP is a project of National Skills Coalition made possible with the generous support of J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation and Strata Education Network, formerly known as USA Funds. Next slide, please. Here you see a list of today's presenters. For the sake of time, I'm not going to introduce everyone now, but instead they can introduce themselves as they speak. I'm going to begin with an overview of SWEEP, followed by the presentations from the four states. After their presentations, we will have a question and answer with the audience. So get your questions ready, and let's go ahead and get started. Next slide, please. State officials have some basic questions they want answers to, such as, do programs lead to credentials and jobs? Do programs work together? How many more skilled workers do employers need? Too often, states lack the data to answer these questions. One of SWEET's goals is to provide better cross-program data that can answer these questions and help states adopt policies that align workforce and education programs with employer skill needs. Next slide. SREAP's toolkit contains three types of data tools, dashboards, pathway evaluators, and supply and demand reports. Next slide. Dashboards use a common set of metrics across programs to answer some of the basic questions. Are people completing programs? Are they receiving credentials? How many get jobs? What do the jobs pay? Dashboards help officials see the programs that are performing well and warrant additional investment and identify other programs that need improvement. Next slide. Pathway evaluators show the patterns of participation in multiple programs and services over time and the related educational and labor market outcomes, with the information broken down by subpopulation. Pathway evaluators can answer questions such as, do programs work together? What pathways work best and for which groups of people? enabling officials to better design effective pathways of programs and services that lead to higher levels of employment and education. Next slide. Supply and demand reports compare the supply of newly trained workers with employer demand as measured by job openings, with the information broken down by education level and field. Supply and demand reports answer questions such as, where are the skill gaps? How many more workers should be trained? With this information, officials can better direct investments to increase capacity to where it's needed. Next slide. During the past nearly two years, SREAP has been working with four states to develop these data tools. Next slide. The goal of SREEP, however, is not data for data's sake, but to have better policy. Here are just some of the policy impacts that SREEP is helping to bring about in the state. California will be using a dashboard to allocate $34 million in strong workforce program performance funds at community colleges throughout the state. Mississippi will be using their pathway evaluators to help inform the custom design of smart career pathways for program participants across workforce programs. Ohio will be using its supply tool to promote business recruitment and to plan higher education investments. 
and Rhode Island will be using their data tools to guide performance funding for post-secondary education and to align the governor's real jobs Rhode Island sector initiative with high demand fields and to identify and address participant barriers to success. Next slide. But enough from me. Let's hear from the states. We're going to begin with Carlos Bravo from the uh -huh. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to Brian and the National Skills Coalition for uh, helping us throughout this whole process and uh, organizing this uh, presentation today. So our talk today will cover how California is still very much in the nascent stages of developing these important data tools that help inform and drive workforce policy. So let's begin by talking about how California's, dash, uh, California's dashboard tool uh, and how that was able to be developed with the help of the National Skills Coalition along with LMID. Uh, next slide, please. And how we were able to engage in a coordinated, uh, through a series of coordinated discussions with potential partners in the development of a dashboard. The discussions that we had primarily focused on construct constructing definitions for our data set, devising a methodology for measurement, drafting draft uh, data sharing agreements, and negotiating timelines for deliverables. Next slide, please. So this here is uh, an overview of what the outcomes look like. This is, these are the tables that inform the, date, the dashboard tool that we will be seeing uh, in, in subsequent uh, slides. Uh, as you can see, we have uh, we decided to use the WIOA methodology of uh, two and four quarters after exit, and we broke it down by a series of demographic uh, variables. Next slide, please. This is an example of what our dashboard can look like. While we're still in the beta phase and uh, we don't have it available for public uh, consumption yet, We've been working tirelessly, again, with the help of LMIB and the National Skills Coalition to have a strong and interactive dashboard data tool that can really inform workforce policy. Next slide, please. So moving forward, what we'd like to do is really expand the number of partners who, are who participate in the workforce metrics dashboard. As of right now, the organizations that we have participating includes Title I, TAA, a Trade Ad Adjustment Assistance, um, the Chancellor's Office, Community Colleges, the Employment Training Panel, and the Division of Apprenticeship Standards. <coughs> Ideally, we'd like to also include the other two, uh, the other three titles of WIOA, uh, Title II, Adult Education, Title III, Wagner Pizer, and uh, Title IV, Department of Rehabilitation. But of course, that's always all um, up to negotiation. Additionally, with these new partners, we'd like to establish a data sharing process um, for the new and existing partners to continue to build and develop on the, um, the lessons that we've learned to this point. And finally, what we're doing at the State Board is uh, amending the current dashboard to really look at developing an impact analysis, which will enable policies that facilitate the movement of people into jobs, uh, providing economic security or job placement in an entry-level job that has a well-articulated career pathway or career ladder to a job providing economic security. So that seemed like kind of a mouthful. Ostensibly, what we want is to find uh, to help people with barriers to employment find good and meaningful, meaningful careers. Um, so now I'd like to hand this off over to my colleague, uh, Matthew Sheroy, so he can talk about the um, supply and demand tool. Next slide, please. Next slide. All right. Uh, for the purpose of the labor market and supply and demand tool, we, we intended to build a tool examining the most recent data available on education, educational programs, completers, and compare it to the average annual job openings. 
to determine if there was an oversupply or undersupply of credentialed workers to fill, to fill the projected demand of an occupation. Next slide. <clears throat> the tool is designed to assist our state educational and governmental policymakers and workforce development leaders to identify the number of middle skilled workers available in targeted occupations to support educational program and workforce planning efforts so they can better potentially uh, evaluate education programs and where to invest or maybe not invest resources. It also may be a source of data to identify where skill gaps may exist in deciding where to invest additional resources and or to make program changes for training needs. Next slide. Here we have a screenshot of our tool, which currently still exists in Microsoft Excel. The tool is designed so users can filter based on their area with the filter buttons above, and then use the occupational filters on the right to select an occupation to examine. So as you can see, we compare the average annual job openings to related program completers for the selected occupations, and then also provide three other charts that further break down the supply data so users can better understand the credentials being earned by the incoming uh, workforce supply. Next slide. Uh, there were some challenges we faced while developing the tool. One, the main one was uh, obtaining supply side data. Uh, we approached two other organizations for data. Uh, one was CalJobs, which has information on UI claimants who went through their systems of training, as well as the Department of Industrial Relations for data on apprenticeships. Uh, however, both of those sources were limited in uh, had data quality issues which made us exclude the data from our tool. Going forward with the project, we are exploring using Tableau data visualization software in order to create a web page so users can explore the data online. Once we do make the tool available to the public, we'll look for additional feedback for improvements and also we will continue to explore other data sources for inclusion into our tool to increase the usefulness of for our uh, now I'll hand it off to Kathy Booth to discuss her career pathway evaluators. Next slide. Thank you. So my name is Kathy Booth and I work with a nonprofit called WestEd that supports the California Community College's Chancellor's Office in figuring out ways to get data into the hands of practitioners to support their decision making. So we've been working over the past four years to develop a tool that brings together the types of things that Sweep was trying to put together statewide. So we've been able to match records from California Community College students to their wage outcomes, as well as some supply and demand data that we're pulling from a labor market information source. So what we chose to do with the Sweep funding was to leverage a new opportunity. The state allocated $200 million in new funding for CTE programs, current technical education programs, and said that a portion of this had to be based on the WIOA measures, where colleges were expected to understand how well they were doing in helping students complete programs and get into living wage jobs and, and secure stronger earnings as a way that they would plan for how to use their funds, and then they'll be evaluated on their performance going forward to um, look at how much money they would receive over time. Next slide, please. So what we wanted to do was put us together a dashboard that would allow practitioners to easily see their prior performance in these WIOA-aligned areas, as well as to do some benchmarking so that they could set some goals and figure out how far they could get with the new funding that they would receive. One of the things that's exciting about this funding is that it includes both dollars that go directly to colleges to support local programs, and then a portion goes to regions to enable colleges to work together to better align their programs with what employers need. Therefore, we had to have the dashboard be sliceable and diceable in lots of different ways. So users can go in and they can see information at the program level, like how did my nursing um, program do. They can look at the sector level and see how they did across all of their allied health programs. They can look at, across their entire college to see, in general, how does going to college impact students' employment and earning potentials. And then they can see the information for their institution or across an entire economic region. So what I want to do is have advance to the next slide and show you exactly what this looks like. So 
we tried to keep it very simple. Um, there's a lot of data that people want to see, but it's easy for this to be overwhelming, especially because many colleges had never really seen their information all in one place in this fashion. So we chose nine metrics, um, most of which are aligned with WIOA, and then we added a couple that we thought were important to contextualize the information. So for example, in addition to looking at employment in the second and fourth quarter, we also have whether they're in jobs closely related to their field of study. In addition to the median earnings, we're looking at their change in earnings, and also whether they managed to get to the living wage in their region. So we're looking here at an example of an accounting program at a specific college in the Bay Area, De Anza College. And you can see that they've just got some fantastic numbers that they can share and use for their planning. Their students are increasing their earnings by 41%, which is tremendous. Um, but there might be areas where they're going to want to do some improvements. For example, there's relatively few students that are earning a degree or certificate. So if you click to the next slide, I'll give you an example of what happens when you dig a little bit deeper. So for any of these metrics, if you click on the plus sign, you're able to see comparison data. So the folks at the end could see um, how they were doing in comparison to their region. And, and California is big enough that we have to have both micro-regions and macro-regions. Um, they can look at their numbers compared to the state. And they can also see how they compare to the top college in the state. And if you moused over that 84%, you'd know which college it was so that you could call them up and ask for advice on how to make your programs more effective as well as looking at what happens over time. So we can see that DeAnza is improving its outcomes for attaining a living wage, which is impressive because this is located in the heart of Silicon Valley that's um, really having a lot of pressures related to housing costs right now. Next slide. So um, we, were, we had so much success with this. All 113 colleges and all of our seven regions use this tool in order to plan for the funding that they've received. Um, and we have put in place a formula that will calculate additional funding that each college and region will receive based on their successful achievement of these outcomes um, that we decided we needed to expand to another area. So one of the big challenges we have in our state is that adult education um, is split between K-12-based organizations and the community colleges, and we needed to find a way to put the data together and to look at what happens to students when they transition from adult ed to post-secondary. So uh, we're, again, using WIOA-aligned metrics, and we have a prototype of that dashboard built. Um, but we're discovering, as our uh, colleagues have at the state level, that the biggest challenge is getting the data to line up, that there's just very different ways that K-12 and community college organize their information. So most of our work has gone to figuring out how to get the plumbing in place so that we can connect those data points together. So that's California's work in a nutshell. Uh, sorry, uh, a nutshell. I'll hand it back to Brian. Thank you, Kathy, and thank you, um, folks from California. Next up is the state of Mississippi. I'm going to turn it over to Zach Kramp for the uh, National Center for uh, Policy uh, for Planning. National Strategic Planning and Analysis Research Center, or better known as NSPARC. Thank you, Brian. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, as uh, Brian said, my name is Zach Krampf. I'm a senior programmer analyst here at NSPARC. We are the state data clearinghouse for the state of Mississippi. And I'm going to be walking you through the prototypes that we have developed under the SWEET project. Next slide. All right, so in uh, speaking about the SWEET prototypes, I want to speak very briefly about LifeTracks. LifeTracks is our data portal for our SLDS. So any SLDS information that you want to know for Mississippi, you go to LifeTracks. Uh, you can, the, uh, the prototypes that we're developing for SWEET, upon full implementation, they will be housed within LifeTracks. So I just want to cover this really quick to give some context. Uh, here you see the home page for LifeTracks. This is publicly available. Uh, you see in the center we've got some images representing the different sections of SLDS data, uh, PK-12, community college, public university. Clicking on one of these images, such as the PK-12 image that's highlighted, will take you to a report list for that section. Next slide. All right, so here we see our report list for PK-12. Uh, we can see a number of different reports here covering demographics and student characteristics, educational progress, uh, various sorts of outcomes. Uh, to run a report of interest, click the Run Report button, like the one highlighted for Student Profile. Next slide, please. And here we see the Student Profile report. Uh, we see the first section, Total Enrollment, is uh, pulled up. So 
we can see we have uh, we had 490,000 students enrolled in PK-12 in Mississippi in school year 2014-2015. Beneath that big number, we have the breakdown table breaking down that big number uh, according to a number of subgroups. Up at the top, we have our control panel that allows us to adjust the parameters of the report. The tabs along the top allow us to choose a different geographic region, so we can view statewide. We can view reports by district, by school. Uh, we can use multi-district area to select a custom region and view aggregate statistics for that region. A lot of variation in how we can uh, adjust the report. We can select reports for multiple years, or we can view trends over time. Uh, so that's a real brief intro to live tracks. Um, and so we, we started looking at the, the data tools under sweep, three types of data tools. And the first one we focused on was dashboards. With live tracks, we, we felt like Mississippi has a strong dashboard system. So we started asking ourselves, where can we increase our reporting focus? And what we came to was workforce training. Next slide, please. So we began working on a set of uh, new reports focusing on non-credit workforce training. Uh, you can see that this looks very similar to what we saw for PK-12. Uh, we see demographics and training characteristics. We also see a variety of outcomes, including subsequent training, uh, post-secondary education after training, and trainees who uh, complete and then enter the workforce looking at, at employment, earnings, and support services. Uh, again, to run a report, you click the Run Report button. Uh, next slide. And here we have our trainee profile report. Again, the layout of our total participant section looks very similar to the total enrollment section from uh, PK-12. We can see that for uh, we owe a Title I training in Mississippi for 2015. We had a little over 3,700 participants. Still have our subgroup table breaking that number down across subpopulations. Our uh, control panel up at the top is a little bit different. We've got uh, our geographic selectors allowing us to break this down by region, uh, we owe a region, and by county as well as a multi-county area giving us a custom region, again, aggregate specific. Next slide. So we've still got our year selector and our historical trends control. And just beneath that, we have a new control allowing us to select which funding source we want to view statistics for. Uh, right now, for the prototype, uh, those, that report is being driven by we owe a Title I data. But we are exploring additional sources of funding, including adult basic education, SNAP and t vocational rehabilitation, uh, and wet fund training, as well as a, uh, a relatively new funding source in Mississippi called the Mississippi Works Fund that's meant to support uh, kind of uh, ad hoc, spur of the moment, um, on the job training. So we're already seeing where these tools are going to be able to support uh, relatively new initiatives in the state. So that's a rundown on the workforce training reports. Next slide, please. The next type of data tool that we focused on were the supply and demand reports. This was a little bit different with dashboards. We felt like uh, we had a strong dashboard system already in place with live tracks. Supply and demand reports, we didn't really have a, an established automated tool for tracking supply and demand and looking for skill gaps in the labor market. So we, uh, we were kind of starting from scratch here other than our manual processes. But we decided to make an automated tool that would focus on the target sectors in Mississippi. Uh, there are eight total, and right now we have data for two in our prototype, Advanced Manufacturing and Healthcare, which you can see here. Uh, healthcare, you can see we've got our supply and demand bars there. There's a, a significant gap that we're showing um, of about 3,600. Advanced Manufacturing, we see a slight gap, but because it's an estimation, we're only, uh, we're only really reporting a skill gap if it's a distinct defined uh, large gap. Uh, so for supply, the way we're currently calculating that is we're is a combination of community college graduates, career and technical education graduates from high schools, and active uh, job seekers in the labor exchange. Uh, and then our demand values are being calculated using job openings in our labor exchange. There are other sources of data that we're, we're exploring, but for right now, those are our, our definitions of, for supply and demand. Next slide, please. So by expanding the, uh, the section for one of the sectors, you can see additional details. Here you can see beneath our supply and demand bars a historical breakdown of supply and demand for healthcare. 
So we can see that we, over the last few years, we didn't always have a skill gap, but it's kind of inched up to the point where there's a skill gap there. And then beneath the historical information, you can see the top 10 healthcare occupations, the top 10 most common occupations in Mississippi within that sector. And we can see supply and demand values for at the occupation level. Uh, so that's supply and demand reports in a nutshell. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so that brings us to our pathway evaluator tools. And this is, uh, this is kind of our latest development, something we're really excited about. Uh, the, the pathway evaluators is something that we have had a limited capacity for with Lifetracks because, uh, as we discussed, there is outcome information available in Lifetracks, but only at a very high level. And we wanted tools that would really allow us to get, get down and, and look at very distinct, specific, step-by-step -step pathways and be able to compare these pathways along a variety of metrics influenced by the uh, core WIOA metrics. So our pathway evaluator tool set is really two tools in one. Uh, the first is the career pathway analyzer. And what this allows you to do is to find a set of starting criteria and or exit criteria and then run an analysis to return the most effective pathways from a particular start to a particular exit or from a particular start to a particular exit. So let's start by defining some starting criteria. Uh, next slide, please. So let's say we want to focus on high school graduates. We're going to uh, define that as our starting criteria. And you'll notice below that we have a box that says current cohort size. And we now have a number there, uh, almost 156,000. That's the number of individuals we have in the data that meet the criteria that we've entered. Uh, so we'll see that shrink as we enter exit criteria. Next slide, please. So we're going to focus on individuals who are employed in other management occupations. That's an ONET title, if it sounds a little bit strange. But you'll notice that our current cohort size has again shrunk uh, pretty dramatically from 156,000 to 771. So now we're going to run an analysis on that cohort. Uh, next slide, please. Here's a sample of our results view. I know it's hard to see. We'll zoom in in just a moment. Uh, we still got our starting condition and exit condition up top. Just beneath that, we've got a panel that allows us to define what metrics we want to sort on. Right now, we're defaulting to uh, average annual earnings in descending order. So we're showing the highest paying pathway first, followed by the second highest paying, third highest paying, et cetera. And then beneath that, we have our pathway results. Next slide, please. So here's our highest paying pathway resulting from that analysis. We can see our starting condition of high school graduate as we specified. We've got our exit condition employed in other management occupations. Uh, and then in between that, we have an interim step. Now in the, the full implementation, we do want to go step by step uh, and have full specific pathways. Uh, we're working with a graph database right now, um, and we're making good progress with that, but we're not quite there yet. So for now, we're looking at interim steps, specifically interim education steps, and comparing those, uh, those steps. So what we're looking at are pathways that start with high school graduation, have some sort of education step, and then uh, have an exit as employed in other management occupations. And we're taking those interim steps and saying, OK, which interim steps lead to the highest average annual earnings in that exit occupation? So our highest paying interim step is a bachelor's degree uh, in business administration, and it results in, for the 35 individuals we have in the data who traverse this pathway, it resulted in average annual earnings of about $42,000. Uh, next slide, please. For an interesting comparison, our third highest paying pathway in this analysis is an associate's degree in business administration. So same, same major, different degree type, and that's giving us an average annual earnings of about $27,000. So we can see a $15,000 gap between the associate's degree and the bachelor's degree within that occupation, even though the major is staying the same. So we're seeing some interesting and exciting results already. Next slide, please. Real quick, the other side of this is the career pathway constructor. The analyzer allows you to put in your starting and exit criteria and then returns uh, the most effective uh, pathways that fit those criteria. The constructor allows you to define a custom pathway step by step and then reports those same metrics for that custom pathway. Uh, the prototype for this isn't quite ready yet. This is a mock screen that we're showing now so the, the data is all simulated. Um, but uh, the prototype's in development, just not quite ready to show yet. Next slide, please. So what's next for us? Uh, 
Uh, well, we're continuing to refine the prototypes, and we plan to present those prototypes early this summer to the SLDS Governing Board that governs everything SLDS related in Mississippi. Uh, upon approval by the board, we'll begin full implementation of the tools, taking them beyond the prototype phase. And then those tools can be used to support various initiatives that are underway in Mississippi. Uh, Brian mentioned the, our WIOA plan, the Smart Start Career Pathway, toward the beginning of the webinar. Uh, our State Workforce Investment Board is working on uh, updating the way that they vet credentials in the state, and this can be used to support that initiative. It can also be used by the Mississippi Legislature to support their focus on performance-based budgeting. So a lot of ways that, that this can be utilized. And of course, we will continue to look to expand our suite of data tools uh, so that we can continue to provide more and more uh, useful, relevant information to our policymakers here in Mississippi. And that's all I have, so I'm going to turn it back to Brian. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Zach. Um, we're now going to move uh, north uh, to Ohio and Cheryl Rice with the Department of Higher Education. Thank you, Brian, and thank you to the National Skills Coalition for your support for the Ohio project, and we're excited to share this with you. Next slide. So in collaboration with the Governor's Office of Workforce Transformation, Ohio Education Research Center with OSU, the Ohio Department of Jobs and Family Services, and of course the Ohio Department of Higher Education, we came together to create um, a project that would meet the following sweep goals. A cross-program data to help better align workforce and education programs collaboratively to support a diverse supply of qualified workers for a strong labor market. And so through policy implications and innovations that will help to close the skill gaps, we want to support sector partnerships with Ohio's industry workforce alliances and, of course, those critical career pathways. Next slide. So the, the task and the deliverables of this project developed a pilot workforce supply report targeting 18 in-demand occupations. And in the future, and hopefully in July, we will have that populated with approximately 180 to 220 in-demand occupations, so more to come. Our plan is to expand into those other in-demand occupations as we're doing our analysis now, and the Governor's Office of Workforce Transformation is leading that through their survey uh, to uh, statewide business and industry leadership. The supply and demand tool under development for 2017 is underway, and we are working to um, continue to share that information and leverage that information moving forward. We want to have a prepared higher education employment outcome solutions and opportunities and conduct analysis of education to an occupation crosswalk. And we did that through survey tools and um, a qualitative look through of the SIP SOC crosswalk in moving that forward. So what we're looking to do is to continue to leverage the dissemination of this tool to institutions of higher education, our business and industry leadership, the workforce work groups, and our state officials. And with that, I'll turn it over to Kristen Harlow, a research associate with OERC, to share more. Next slide, please. So I just, before we take a look at the um, data tool, I wanted to talk about, as Sherry mentioned, uh, a part of our suite project has been um, talking to post-secondary programs that we identified as sources of supply for Ohio's in-demand occupations. Um, we talked to folks and asked them whether they were, one, in fact, training students who we, um, for those occupations that we thought they were connected with, and also whether, in fact, the students graduating from those programs went on to those occupations we expected them to based on our analysis. Um, and the results of that were that we found, um, unsurprisingly, some uh, data collection or consistency issues with uh, which programs are being categorized and which programs. Um, but in addition, we found sort of a range. There are some programs that were tightly coupled, the, the um, training programs with occupations, for example, welding or machining. Um, but in addition, Ohio is really interested in IT-related occupations because they are in demand. Um, and the connections between those training programs and occupations are a bit less clear and somewhat more difficult to delineate um, because 
programs and occupations in this space are changing so quickly. Um, and these findings are going to help us understand the nature of supply and the comparison between supply and demand in the tool that we're building moving forward. Next slide, next slide please. Um, but, but first I want to show you the tool that we ha um, already have built. That um, The URL for this uh, tool will be in the slides that you can download after this webinar, but you can also actually Google Ohio Workforce Supply Tool and it'll come up. Um, but we developed this tool as a partnership of state agencies, including the um, Governor's Office of Workforce Transformation, Department of Higher Ed, um, Job and Family Services, and um, uh, Ohio State. Um, and the purpose is to provide information um, about potential sources of supply of workers for businesses either in Ohio or looking to relocate to Ohio that are looking for particular um, workers in particular occupations. Um, the site is live, but it's still in beta. It currently only includes um, our highest uh, 20 or so highest in-demand occupations. But as Sherry mentioned, um, the rollout um, of a full cohort of about 200 um, is scheduled for July. Um, and this can also be found as a tool within our Ohioans Jobs website. Next slide, please. So I'm going to show you a couple screenshots to just give you a sense for what's inside this uh, tool. Um, in general, the site provides information about workforce supply for particular occupations within each of these six regions of the state. Um, on the top, you can see that there are drop-down menus where you can choose a particular occupation or region. Um, and then below is the data. Uh, we have, um, it, for this example, we chose welders to just give you a sense of what's in here. Um, and you can see uh, below the map, there's a number of tabs with different uh, types of information that you can um, see about, in this case, welders. Uh, there's uh, some ONET descriptions. And then on the right side, there's some regional labor statistics um, that we uh, pulled by region, uh, including number of employees and um, the, uh, sort of the range of earnings for those for welders. Next slide, please. So if you click the next, uh, the workforce supply tab, the next tab over, it provides information about the total number of graduates or completers of programs related to welding. Um, so as you can see, um, the most training programs for welding are certificate programs. And you can see that the um, graph on the left there sort of shows by level. Um, the number of graduates uses two years of actual reported completers, and then we um, provide projections for two years as well. Um, on the right-hand side, you can see that we have unemployment information to give context for an additional potential source of supply for that occupation, um, as well as a link to um, an existing Ohio Means job page that where they, um, the Job and Family Services folks provide a, a monster report of resumes uh, for this occupation as well, if that information is of interest. Next slide. Um, so here we're looking at, at welders in the northwestern part of the state. If you look up at the top, we've selected northwest Ohio, and the map zooms in. Um, those white dots are the locations of post-secondary institutions that are training welders in the northwestern part of the state. And the total graduates chart um, has uh, recalibrated itself to show just those uh, graduates or completers from Northwestern Ohio. Next slide, please. The Graduating Institutions tab provides some more details about the institutions on the map. Um, these are institutions with graduates or completers of post-secondary programs that we've identified that train workers in for welding in this particular instance. So it's not every institution in Northwest Ohio. You can choose an institution by clicking on the map or clicking on the list. And then on the right side, you can see the number and level of graduates from that particular program. Most importantly, we've provided uh, address and web information for that institution. So um, the hope is that businesses that are interested uh, can then forge relationships between um, themselves and institutions that may be able to train workers that they are interested in hiring to better align our supply and demand in the state. Next slide, please. And I just wanted to provide you one other um, example just to sort of see the differences. This is an IT uh, field. We're looking at software developers here. Um, notice that there's uh, uh, below the total graduates graph, there's something called graduates come from the following programs. Um, this is because for uh, software developers, there's a range of different types of training programs that train individuals to become software developers. Um, in the IT space, as we mentioned, it's, it's not quite a one-to-one -one match. Um, 
And the next slide, please. Oh, there it is. Um, so it's it's important to when you're looking at the institution um, to notice that again below the University of Toledo uh, number of graduates it tells you specifically which programs they have at the University of Toledo and of course you can see the level as well. So this beta site is live again you can feel free to Google it play around with it see what you think. Um, the source of data for each graph it varies by graph. Um, is below uh, with a link. Um, and for the, for the um, graph in which we did our own calculations, for example, for the projections, there's a data details tab that gives you information about that. Next slide, please. And finally, I just wanted to mention, um, we are in the process of developing a tool that will compare um, the supply and demand within this, giving a statewide look for Ohio to see where Ohio's post-secondary institutions are producing a sufficient supply to meet demand or where we may be able to use some additional training capacity um, and that is uh, in development for this year so you can stay tuned for that. That's all we have. Back to you Brian. Okay, thank you Kristen. And now for our, our fourth and final state which is Rhode Island, I'm going to turn it over to Joe Gresty. Uh, thank you, Brian, and the National Skills Coalition for this opportunity. Uh, again, my name is Joe Gresti. I work in our state's labor market information unit. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the work we did uh, creating the supply and demand report and how it is helping to inform higher education in the new performance-based funding formula. Next slide, please. So uh, this sweep work came at an opportune time. Our uh, Commissioner of Post-Secondary Education, Dr. Jim Purcell, um, asked us uh, at the Labor Market Information Unit, can you tell me what fields of study lead to high demand, high wage occupations? Next slide, please. So um, this led to a joint effort between um, the state's LMI division and higher education, and we spent, spent months creating a custom four-digit SIP, two six-digit SOC crosswalk for the state um, with uh, Dr. Phyllis Harnick. And uh, big thanks to uh, Richard Fischel, who is one of the uh, consultants that uh, Sweep contracted out for us. Next slide, please. So um, after, after the crosswalk was completed, uh, we worked together to define um, high demand, high wage field of studies. And um, it was important to produce a definition that could generate buy-in from multiple stakeholders, uh, because ultimately this definition was going to be used in the performance funding formula. Next slide, please. So just to give you an idea of the final results, um, we ended up with, we identified 113 uh, four-digit CIP codes that lead to high demand, high wage occupations as for our definition. Um, as a side bonus to this, we also identified 41 four-digit CIP codes that weren't offered at all at any of our uh, three public institutions. Next slide, please. So that was, that was the work. And so now I'm going to show you a little bit how this is informing policy in Rhode Island. Um, sailing ahead is the strategic plan for post-secondary education in Rhode Island. The goal in the strategic plan was a 20% increase in the total number of graduates in high demand, high wage areas by 2020-2021. Next slide, please. This is the Senate bill that kind of started it all. It's called the Performance Incentive Funding Act of 2016. Next slide, please. It was signed into law um, in August of 2016 with three main priorities, one of which um, is increasing the graduates in high demand, high wage fields of study. Next slide, please. Um, as you can see from this donut chart, 20% uh, of the formula is actually based on the school's ability to increase high demand, high wage certificates and degrees. Next slide, please. Here is a uh, timeline. The Senate bill uh, passed in March of 2016. It was signed into law in August of 2016. And um, the funding distribution process for this uh, will begin in academic year 18-19. Uh, Next slide, please. So uh, again, the goal in strategic plan was a 20% increase in total number of graduates um, in high demand, high wage areas by 2020, 2021 at our three public institutions. Uh, that you have to give an idea that is the base. The base year is 2014-15, and the uh, 2020 target. The definitions are not yet set in stone. That due date is on October 1st, but this is how it currently looks right now. So. Um, 
we use the, the sweep crosswalk uh, basically to identify um, those graduates there. Uh, next slide, please. Finally, uh, we plan to continue the joint work between the Post-Secondary Commissioner's Office and the Labor Market Information Division. <laughs> this is a uh, snapshot of our new yearly publication, The Supply and Demand for New Workers, and it highlights the undersupply of public and private graduates in Rhode Island. And that's all I have for the uh, Supply and Demand tool. I'm going to pass it off to uh, Rob Kalskowski, the Chief of Policy and Planning for the Governor's Workforce Board in Rhode Island. Thank you. Next slide. Uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, as my colleague mentioned, uh, Sweep generously uh, helped Rhode Island on two fronts. In addition to the advanced supply and demand analysis, the funds also assisted in the development of a comprehensive workforce development uh, performance dashboard. Next slide, please. Like many states, Rhode Island has many different quote-unquote workforce development programs across state and federal funding streams. Uh, the Governor's Workforce Board has been legislatively anointed as the main overseer and coordinator for all of these programs. However, performance data collection and quality vary dramatically across them. And without bringing them all in one place, it was difficult to use this data without having the context for all this information. Next slide, please. The opportunity was, uh, that SWEET provided was to be able to develop a single plain English, user-friendly, and visually appealing dashboard for a range of audiences. Uh, joining this dashboard uh, then to robust interagency data uh, from our sister agencies with health, education, corrections, and others uh, not only allows us to review performance, but also to begin some very, uh, to ask some very interesting and important programmatic questions. Next slide, please. Uh, in advance, before we began, uh, we developed a core six set of metrics that could fairly be applied across these litany of programs uh, to capture the various impacts of workforce development. These build on, but uh, as our colleagues in other states, uh, do go beyond the core WIO metrics. And we laid a lot of runway and spent several months developing interagency uh, data sharing agreements to allow all this to happen. With that done, we built the digital infrastructure necessary to take in these multiple data sets and present the information visually then worked on a 1.0 version that was focused on core WIOA, began to lay the necessary pipe for additional data sets, and eventually want to make that shift from breadth of data to depth of data by cross-linking this performance data with our longitudinal data system. So we have already with this vendor um, an immense amount of information from our, our agencies in health, in education, in corrections, uh, the gold standard actually has been Motor Vehicle Bureau information. So that's all there, and they have spent literally years linking it and uh, de-identifying, but then cross-linking it to one another. To add this performance um, outcome information is, uh, is the next step. And then again, as I mentioned in the previous slide, begin to query some, some really impactful questions. Next slide, please. We also face some issues. Uh, in, in doing so. Uh, internally, we lost some mission critical staff not long after we secured the SWEEP grant. Uh, we had a vendor issue. The first vendor that we worked with um, uh, really broke off contact very quickly, which was disappointing. Uh, and the selected vendor, with whom we've got a lot of opportunity with, there were challenges with its parent organization, not with the vendor itself, but with its host. And so uh, it resulted in a move to a more academic setting um, which actually is a far better fit for us in the sense that they're now kind of a sister agency um, in that role, which makes uh, data requests and analytic requests a lot easier. Uh, there also has been some progress. The internal uh, digital infrastructure that was necessary to bring in data and visually present it is complete. We are connecting to our first data performance set. Uh, we hope to have that done actually by the end of this week. We will implement visual uh, design improvements uh, shortly after to follow before we go live. And then uh, we will public, uh, public, uh, publicize our first 1.0. Uh, next slide, please. So this is not exactly what it's going to look like, but it's a sample visualization of, of what the tool uh, is intended to look like. Uh, it's not cleaned up and uh, polished, but it will show the ability. Next slide, please. 
So here we have uh, 2014 WIOA uh, information uh, of employment at the first, second, third, and fourth quarter, quarterly earnings, and then demographic information. At the top, you see a, a bar line of programs. Each one of those programs can serve as a control for this dashboard. So by selecting, for example, the purple one known as Real Jobs, which is our in-state uh, sector-driven workforce development program. So basically, we, we put a blank piece of paper in front of our industry sectors, and they write the training curriculum all the way down to the recruitment and placement uh, as well. And you click on any one of those, and immediately the whole thing repopulates to only show that information. Uh, even more important, I think, is that you can also control by population. So at the bottom there, if you click on any of these series, uh, next slide. If you click on any of the bottom series, for example, if you wanted to see only how college-educated Hispanic males fared in certain programs or across multiple programs, you can do that, which will open up the door to kind of um, specific comparisons for how uh, populations, how income levels are being served. And um, eventually the data will include uh, more um, metrics and measures and, of course, more programs as well. Next slide. In terms of next steps, we want to uh, continue to visually improve the 1.0 dashboard, at which point we want to uh, not only publicize it, but follow up with a public awareness campaign for both policy leaders and uh, a few demonstration projects for uh, thought leaders and academics across the state. We will continue to build out our data infrastructure to allow for more partners to plug in. And we'll eventually start to run some analytics on these numbers and answer some pressing policy questions. Um, next slide. This concludes our report and presentation. The state of Rhode Island would like to thank NSC for its support, uh, NCS, excuse me. And we look forward to continuing to work together on advancing the nation's skills. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. I'd like to point out that each of the four states has written a report, which we will soon be posting on National Skills Coalition's tweet uh, page um, on our website so that you can uh, spend some time looking into more detail regarding their data tools and how they're using their data tools. I'm going to now turn it over to Jenna Leventhoff, policy analyst with the Workforce Data Quality Campaign, who will be moderating the questions and answers. But one thing I, I do want to point out before turning it over to Jenna, moving forward, Jenna is going to be leading National Skills Coalition's and Workforce Data Quality Campaign's assistance to the state. So states that would like assistance, uh, particularly in terms of developing or adopting policies uh, for data sharing and for the development of these data tools, uh, Jenna will uh, be our lead. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jenna to moderate the questions. Thank you, Brian. So we've gotten a handful of questions already. If you would like to leave more questions, uh, there's a question section, and those will Send, send themselves to me. Uh, so the first question we got is a pretty easy one. California, where do you get your annual job opening data and um, as well as information about the students that the institutions are training? So this is Kathy, and I can provide information about where the students are being trained. So there's um, data that's collected by the California Community Colleges Chancellor's Office for all of the community colleges. Basically, every college is required to report information up into a master data set, and that's both what populated the Strong Workforce Program tab, as well as um, was handed over to the, the State Workforce Development Board to support work on the supply and demand tool and on the data dashboard. Thank you, Kathy. And uh, uh, yeah, our demand, uh, the annual a average uh, projections came from a projections unit. The next question we got is an interesting one and something that I've found a lot in my work. But if anyone on this webinar has ever tried to share data across state agencies, maybe you work for a state agency, you know that it can be difficult. Other agencies might be reluctant to give up control of their information, usually for worries about violating FERPA, which is an education privacy law, 
or unemployment insurance confidentiality laws. So one of the questions we got asked, how have states overcome this issue um, and really create, fostered an environment where agencies want to share the data that, that are necessary for these tools? Um, let's start it off with Mississippi, because you have a strong data sharing environment in your state. Hi, can you repeat the question one more time? Yes. So the question is basically, um, how have you overcome sort of agency fears about sharing their data uh, lest they violate SERPA or unemployment insurance confidentiality laws, and how do you foster a strong data sharing environment among state agencies? All right, well, we have a, uh, a board in place that governs the, the SLDS, that governs the use of the data that's collected. Um, the data is all stored here uh, at the, uh, at, here at Inspark State Data Clearinghouse, but the board is made up of members of each of the contributing agencies. Um, and so there's a lot of transparency. There's uh, a uh, common understanding of what is and isn't being done with the data. Um, and each agency has a measure of control over its own, still has a measure of control over its own data, even though it's all connected um, and all being used uh, together. And that's uh, just kind of building that, that cooperation, that understanding among the state agencies by everybody having a hand in it, everybody having a hand in leadership over the process uh, has built um, a, a lot of collaboration, a lot of trust in the state and it's helped to foster a better understanding of the uh, rules and regulations surrounding the sharing of data and the uh, use of shared data in reporting. Thank you. Um, I'd like to, this is I think an interesting question, would any of the other state participants like to respond to the question about how they fostered strong data sharing within their agencies and overcame fears about violating privacy and privacy laws? Sure. Uh, this is uh, Go ahead. Sorry. No, please. I, I go ahead. <laughs> All right. Um, this is California. So uh, our process was. Uh, I, I think I'd like to say a thing or two about it because we're still, again, like I said uh, in the beginning, we're still very much in the nascent stages. So this is really. Um, we've really been in the beginning processes of developing data sharing, and um, what we've done is a series of things. So first of all. Uh, we learned and we uh, inquired from our predecessors, our states that have been successful on what they did to, um, to be able to secure and overcome these hurdles that you talk about. So really the way that we approached it was uh, on multiple fronts. So first of all, my colleague, uh, Lauren Shamanic, what he did was he really spearheaded a, um, a collaborative partnership where this was a partner-driven engagement. So ostensibly, much like what Zach said, nothing that was uh, going to be involved in the dashboard or in um, any of the data sharing would, would be, uh, wouldn't be agreed to by uh, amongst all the partners that were mandated to participate. So really, that's getting uh, buy-in by the partners. Now, when we got to the nitty-gritty and we had to actually share the data, then we um, had to go through a series of data sharing agreements that involved uh, uh, lawyers and um, just a lot of back and forth working on language. And um, we really found that beneficial uh, because we learned, of, first of all, we learned a lot about the data sharing process and um, a lot of the complications and intricacies that are involved. Um, and then secondly, uh, it really, um, spearheaded and solidified what we wanted to do. Uh, one last thing I'll note is that in California, uh, in the spirit of collaboration and partnership, if anyone, if any agency felt uncomfortable um, but wanted to participate at a future time, we, we allowed them the opportunity to, um, to not participate initially and that we'll continue working and negotiating along the way. So, um, so that's something that will, uh, as I mentioned in, in the last slide for California, um, that's something that we're going to work on in the in the future iterations of the dashboard and other da uh, other data workforce tools, is really um, just slowly bringing in 
our partners uh, from different agencies uh, to be mindful of all the uh, realities and privacy issues that you're talking about, like FERPA, like HIPAA, so on and so forth, um, and really just uh, have have a, a develop a level of trust and comfort amongst agencies and amongst partners to be willing to share their data. Hi, yeah, this is Ohio. I, I am. Um, I just want to echo what was has already been said that it has to be sort of a collaborative process. Here we um, have a partnership called Ohio Analytics. It's within Ohio State University, but it's actually a partnership of all the agencies whose data we collect and store together as the Ohio Longitudinal Data Archive. Um, and that is, as again, we have a data stewards committee and a policy council overseeing that process that includes members from all of the agencies whose data we hold. And it's been a, a, a very long process to come to the point where we have as much data in there as we have. It, again, as you know, others have said that the legal process of the data sharing agreements um, can be difficult to negotiate and hash through. But um, because we had sort of this overseeing, this board that oversees it, where every agency um, still owns control of their own data, even though it's housed here and used together, where every time we use their data, there's a process that we go through so that they can review all the things that we do with the data to make sure that it makes sense to them, that it's being used appropriately. Um, and that whole process um, came together as a partnership. So um, yeah, I would reiterate that that's important in building trust amongst the agencies. So uh, for Rhode Island, um, our perspective might be a little unique being as small as we are, but um, we had for, we, we've had a lot of track lead on the, our WDQI Workforce Data Quality Initiative that um, for years now has been the backbone of this thing. So we had some, some work done in advance. And one of the things that can really trip up these data sharing agreements is when your, your tech office and your legal office um, do it in sequence and not together. So your IT folks will begin to talk about the you know, cybersecurity components of it. And then once they're done, it goes to legal. And that adds another you know, however many months. Um, a, we made sure that those meetings happened uh, at the same time, and each agency kind of um, internally briefed their IT outfit and their legal outfit to explain what the effort was going to look like, what the expectations were, so they could kind of air their concerns uh, there before they brought it to the larger group. And then secondly, and I think maybe equally important, was we had a very strong executive office push on this. Um, and they had our, our uh, Department of Administration, which is kind of the, the crown of, of all the different agencies, um, really quarterback the whole effort, which kind of uh, put our, each individual's department legal uh, at ease a little bit, where not, none of them wanted to go off the reservation and be wrong and then find out that they got in trouble, so to speak. So by having the DOA there from the get-go um, writing a lot of this work, uh, all of the legal departments kind of laid down their, their arms and said, okay, well, if, if DOA is okay with it, then I, I have no problem. So that shaved off a lot of time because um, each agency would have wanted to punch it up and, and take it apart and put it back together again. But because it had that executive blessing, it moved things a lot quicker. Thank you so much. I think that um, touched upon uh, one of the really yeah. interesting parts of this work that it's not just about the tools that we use, but also just about the collaboration between agencies and ways to bring in all stakeholders at the beginning so that they don't get as nervous about it. Uh, the next question is, that we've gotten... This is, this, this is Zach from Mississippi. I wanted to add one additional thing. Uh, because you had mentioned FERPA specifically, I um, did want to say that uh, you know, FERPA doesn't, doesn't uh, prohibit the sharing of information, the use of, of shared information among state agencies. Um, instead, what it does is it really just uh, puts some regulations on the use of that data. So you have to, to make sure that you have a process that's compliant with laws like FERPA or HIPAA. So you've got to make sure that you've got a process, uh, a process of, of sharing the data and re reporting that data that, uh, that aligns itself with the purpose of, of improving your, your education workforce systems that uh, de-identifies the data. Um, and uses in, and restricts the, the reportable cell size to make sure that you're protecting the privacy of individuals and small groups, um, which, which protects protecting that privacy. Uh, you, you can then you then have a FERPA uh, 
compliant means of reporting that shared data. And then it's a matter of showing that, demonstrating that to your state agencies and to the, the legal entities that you need to deal with. Once they understand that, then you have your governance in place and then everybody's on the same page. Yeah, that's a good not, point. SERPA um, is a lot more about, you know, there's restrictions, but they're very easy to overcome. And there's a lot of resources online for those that are interested. Um, we can certainly touch base after this webinar, and I can direct you to some. But one of the ones that first comes to mind is the PTAC, the Privacy and Technical Assistance Center at the, I want to say the Department of Education. They give a lot of guidance on FERPA for state agencies that are worried about. Um, hey, Jenna? Jenna? Yes. Can I add something? This is California. Sorry, I have one more thing, too. Um, so this is a really good question, obviously. I think that's why there's a lot of engagement from the states. But um, I really wanted to uh, just help uh, give, give maybe some word of advice or some thought process, some uh, lessons learned uh, for states that are beginning the data sharing process. Uh, for us in California, uh, as I said, we're still very much beginning and starting this process. So what I would, uh, what I would encourage every state that's really starting to uh, engage in this is to look at this as an iterative process. So you're not going to get everything and everyone you want to participate the first time around. So really look at it as a series of um, drafts or betas, um, you know, a testing process where, you know, you want to get something, establish something, and build something initially, and then really uh, grow and build upon that subsequently. You know, it, it's always the hardest step is just getting something done. The hardest first step is always just having something complete. And then, so I would really encourage states to just start there and then build. Thank you. I'm, I'm glad that this topic has sparked a robust conversation because it certainly is an interesting one and one that a lot of states face. But I'm going to change gears a little bit. Um, we got a question that said a lot of these tools obviously seem like they're oriented towards policymakers or educators and other professionals. And I think a big part of that is because the SWEET project is intended to create tools that are going to help policymakers create better policies. Um, but obviously, information like this can also be useful to students and workers as they're trying to figure out career paths and where to look for information. So has there been any talk of adjusting these tools to serve a different audience? Or um, if not, I know uh, Kathy from California, Cal the California Community College has a tool explicitly for students. Can you talk about that a little bit and how this information is also, also useful to another audience? Absolutely. I think that what's important to understand when you're working with data like this is that there's different things you want to present to different people. So a lot of what we were focused on in, in this was helping educators really move past thinking about what happens in their classroom or their counseling office and look at the longer term outcomes of what happens to students down the road. Because historically, with the focus of funding being on access, um, Colleges tend to focus much more on that, like getting people in the door and making sure they have an opportunity at, a, at an education. Uh, what California has done is then taken the same data set and packaged it in other ways for other audiences. So if you look at some of the really good research that's been done by the Community College Research Center, what it says is that when students go to college, what they're really concerned about is what kind of job they could get and what classes they need to take in order to reach that job, how fast they can get there, how much financial aid they're going to need, and whether they can transfer, especially if they're starting at a community college, because most people see themselves as bachelor's degree material. So what the Chancellor's Office did is it created a series of tools that are designed to answer those questions. So there's a mobile app called Here to Career. So you can go on and you can take a short quiz to sort of figure out what your interests might be related to occupational clusters. And then it will tell you where there are community colleges in your area that offer programs um, that teach those skills. You can find out labor market data about how much money you'd be likely to make if you stayed close to home. And then there are videos being created with descriptions of what the programs are like and what it means, like what, what kind of things you have to be um, good at or enjoy in order to be successful in the program as well as in the job that that program leads to. So I think that tools like this create the, the policy environment in which you could quickly pivot, and particularly if you're working with um, your target audience like students or, or parents or um, advocacy groups in the community, you can figure out how you're going to um, present that information in a way that answers their burning questions. I think that's a really good point, Kathy, is that 
it's ultimately the same information and just packaged differently. And a big part of once you have the information is thinking about the best way to package it. And so something that we've always encouraged states to do is to really think about who their audience is for individual tools and to adjust how they're presenting information accordingly. And a lot of states have had a lot of success when they think about those questions ahead of time, creating tools that are useful for different audiences. Um, I'm going to shift gears a little bit now again. This question is for the smaller states, uh, like Rhode Island, or states like Ohio that tend to share large labor markets with, say, Kentucky. Um, so are any of you thinking about partnerships or collaboration efforts across state lines to leverage the work that you've done? And if this isn't something that you're actively doing, is it something you've been thinking about and why? You know, what sort of policy questions do you think having cross-state collaboration could help you answer? Uh, let's start with um, Ohio alphabetically, and then we'll switch to Rhode Island. So um, kind of is the answer. <laughs> We've been trying to work through, of course, every state when you use um, you know, sort of UI wage data to look at employment outcomes, you're limited to data within the state. And so in that context, we've been trying to work with neighbor states because, like you said, Cincinnati is partly in Kentucky. We have the same issue with Toledo. It's right near Michigan. Um, so finding ways that we could leverage um, that um, employment outcome data from other states, uh, we've, you know, there's a number of different options we've talked through. Um, the most recent one that actually may be useful is and I'm not going to, this is not my area, so I'm not going to remember these acronyms, but something called SWIS, which I can't remember what it stands for, but it's a data sharing agreement among states um, that are all part of a single agreement um, so that we can be able to build tools that um, address sort of labor market outcomes across state lines. And this is Sherry, and I just want to share that uh, from a regional standpoint, not maybe from a statewide perspective, but from a regional standpoint, there is a little bit of work that's going on between the Youngstown area and Pennsylvania, um, and where they are, they have a collaborative that they're working on advanced manufacturing opportunities in that area there. So it's not a statewide collaboration or sharing of data, but it works in these smaller regional approaches. But to Kristen's point, we have some. Um, kind of issues with state-to-state -state type of data sharing. Thanks. Uh, Rhode Island, have you thought about this issue at all, or do you have anything to add? Uh, sure. This is Joe. I'll speak uh, briefly. Um, we've, the, the majority of our workers that work out of state work in Massachusetts, but uh, Massachusetts has historically been um, not a share so um, if anything can come out of this conversation, I would just hope that it would be that uh, the, the folks and the policymakers in Massachusetts would be more willing to share um, information with Rhode Island because at this point it's it's tough to you know to, to work on something together with with somebody who won't share. So um, that that's all I have. Sorry. No, that's all right. I mean, it does similar to interstate cooperation or cross-state collaboration also needs to kind of come across holistically and, you know, be something that you work at. It doesn't just happen. Um, looks like we're actually running up on time, so I'm going to answer, I think, the last question, which was, will SWEEP have any additional grants for projects like these? The results are excellent. Um, I don't know the exact answer to that question about grants. What I do know is, as Brian mentioned earlier, um, I will be taking over sort of the state technical assistance work. Um, we're going to be placing that in our Workforce Data Quality Campaign, which is a project of national skills focusing on fostering strong state and federal use of data to improve um, the workforce. And so if you come across or you have questions or you're looking to create a similar tool in your state, what I am happy to provide for you moving forward is assistance or help thinking about the sort of steps to take and sort of and how to go about that. So, Moving forward, my email is Jenna L at workforcedqc.org. You can find it also on the National Skills website, and we're really happy to do that. Um, I'm sorry we couldn't get to answer everyone's great questions today, but um, we'll try to follow up with people after the webinar to see if we can't answer them. Thank you all so much for tuning in, and have a fantastic afternoon. <laughs>